Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are waiting for everyone to log on to today's webinar, and we will start shortly. Hello everyone, we are waiting for people. They are still logging on to today's webinar and we will begin in just a minute. All right, aloha everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is called Our Care, Our Choice Act, Medical Aid in Dying, a panel discussion on Hawaii's Our Care, Our Choice Act experiences. My name is Samantha Trad. I am the Compassion and Choices Hawaii State Director, and I am very honored to be today's moderator. If you have a question for today during the webinar at any time, feel free to click on the box on your screen that says question and answer and type your question in there and we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of today's webinar. Um, again, at any time you can type in your question on the screen and we will get to as many questions as possible. And um, we're copying and pasting them into a Google Sheet. So if it says your question's been dismissed, don't worry, that just means we've captured it. It doesn't mean we've you know, decided not to answer your question. Today's webinar is being recorded, but don't worry, we can't see you. So you're welcome to, you know, sip your coffee and eat your chocolate if that's what you're doing. And if you are, I'm very jealous. We are very honored today to have an incredible lineup of speakers. First and foremost, we have Laura Archibald from the Department of Health. She is the Hawaii State Telehealth and Healthcare Access Coordinator. We also have Dr. Charles Miller joining us. He has led the um, end of life, uh, our care, our choice act process through Kaiser Permanente and talk about that experience. We have Michelle Quintillo here today. She is a registered nurse and is the advanced care planning coordinator at Hawaii Pacific Health. Dr. Brian Goodyear is a clinical psychologist who's done, I think well over 30 mental health assessments for the Our Care, Our Choice Act. We also have Susan Amina with us. She is a nurse practitioner at Kaiser Permanente and is one of the navigators for their Our Care, Our Choice Act um, process, as well as Jody Shaw, who also helps at Kaiser Permanente for, with patients who want the option of medical aid in dying. Jody is a licensed social worker. She's also a CCM, OSWC, and an APHSWC. We're also joined by Jake Blechta, a pharmacist who um, owns and manages Elix RX and has filled a number of medical aid and dying prescriptions. Uh, Dr. Charlotte Sharfin, who was the first doctor on a neighbor island to prescribe medical aid and dying. She is an emergency medicine provider on Hawaii Island. And finally, Dr. David Grube, who is the medical director for Compassion and Choices. Compassion and Choices improves care, expands options, and empowers everyone to chart their end of life journey. The learning objectives today, today is part two of a two-part series webinar on medical aid and dying in Hawaii. If you missed the first one, you can still watch the recording, which I highly recommend. Today, you will be able to review clinical competencies for participating in medical aid and dying and requirements of the law describe how telehealth telemedicine meets requirements for medical aid and dying laws, provide an update on Our Care, Our Choice Act numbers for Hawaii, examine the team-based approach to medical aid and dying, and review pharmacy updates, experiences, and issues. Now, part of the way we're able to get you all continuing education credits for social workers here is through our polls. So the first poll we would like to know how familiar are you with medical aid in dying? So if you can take a minute and answer the poll on your screen, we can pull up that poll. How familiar are you with medical aid in dying? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, not at all familiar. And this is an easy one because there's no right answer. Oh, 
All righty. I think that just about everybody has voted. Can you show the results, please? So it looks like most of you are somewhat familiar with um, others who are very familiar and not at all familiar. And um, I guess we'll do the second poll now. So we have a second poll. Um, we would also like to know who you are, who is with us today. Are you a registered nurse, an APRN, a licensed clinical social worker, psychologist, physician, or other? This is such a nice, efficient voting process. All righty, it looks like most people have voted. Let's go ahead and share those results. All right, it looks like the vast majority of you are licensed clinical social workers. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are really grateful to have you. Um, I'm gonna do a quick review of the basics. We already went over this in part one, but for those of you who missed it or need a refresher, I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly so we can get to the juice of today's um, webinar. Um, so if you have questions, you know, please feel free to ask. And again, I encourage you to watch part one of the webinar. So as a reminder, medical aid in dying is one of many end of life options. So first of all, many patients want to pursue life sustaining treatment. Uh, it's also possible to refuse treatment. Sometimes people forget that they can always say no to a treatment, even if a doctor's recommending it. Discontinuing treatment if it's not doing what you would like it to do. Um, palliative care is a great and wonderful thing that can help patients um, have their pain managed. Hospice, we, we highly encourage everyone to enroll in hospice. Hospice is such a wonderful uh, service for people at the end of life. Voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, also known as VSED. Um, if you're interested in a free presentation or webinar just about voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, we do provide that, so please let us know. Uh, continuous deep sedation, and then of course, medical aid in dying. And I think it's always important to remember that none of these options are mutually exclusive. A patient can choose um, more than one of these options and quite often does. So what do we mean when we say medical aid in dying? Well, medical aid in dying is a medical practice in which a mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less to live may request a doctor's prescription for medication, which they can choose to self-ingest to peacefully end intolerable terminal suffering. In order to qualify for medical aid in dying, you need to be an adult, a resident of Hawaii, you need to be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live, you need to be mentally capable of making informed medical decisions. This means this is not an option for people who have advanced dementia, and you also need to be able to self-ingest the medication yourself. There's no assistance with medical aid in dying. All righty, time for another poll question. See if you all are still with me and awake. The question today, the patient only needs to make one request to his or her physician in order to proceed with medical aid in dying, true or false? Now, if you missed the first part of this webinar, you might get it wrong and that's okay. Don't be afraid to be to have the wrong answer, sometimes that's how you learn best. Um, can you tell I used to be a teacher? <laughs> so true or false, the patient only needs to make one request to his or her or their physician in order to proceed with medical aid in dying. It looks like just about everyone else, everyone has voted. Go ahead and share the results, please. So the majority of you got that correct. The answer is false. The patient, um, the patient only needs to make one request to their physician in order to proceed with medical aid and dying. No, they have to make two oral requests and hopefully this will be changed to their provider so that advanced practice registered nurses can be included who are qualified. Um, but the patient has to make two oral requests that are separated by at least 20 days. Now this can be a very long time for a terminally ill patient. So that's why it's really important to get the process started as early as possible if the patient thinks this is something that they want. Um, the requests don't necessarily have to be in person, but you do need to confirm the patient's voluntariness of the person's request that it's their own free will and the patient must make one written request signed by two witnesses. 
Um, additional requirements. The patient also needs to make the request to a consulting physician who has to confirm the patient's terminal illness and six month prognosis. And again, you also need to have that written request signed by two witnesses. And there are special requirements about who can sign that written request, the two different witnesses. Um, and if this sounds confusing, we have a, a little booklet to help um, both patients and providers support the patient through the process. Um, and the Department of Health also has a really wonderful chart of how it works for providers that we will send to you um, after today's webinar. Current provider components. So the pre prescribing physician um, is called the attending provider. And um, there, there is legislation at the state legislature to hopefully change this to also allow advanced practice registered nurses with prescribing authority to be able to um, be included in this role. So this is really the main provider who will evaluate the patient, document everything, follow the compliance process, and in the end, if the patient qualifies, prescribe the medication. The consulting physician or provider evaluates the patient and also has documentation, and then a psychiatrist, psychologist, or licensed clinical social worker must evaluate the patient to make sure they have mental capacity to make an informed medical decision. Now, Hawaii's law is modeled after Oregon's law. Oregon has had their law for over 20 years, and now nine states in Washington, D.C. all have similar medical aid and dying laws. And Hawaii is actually the only state that requires the mental capacity assessment. Every other state, it's optional. And Hawaii has the longest minimum mandatory waiting period of 20 days. Every other state has 15 days, um, with the exception of Montana, which uh, was authorized through a Supreme Court decision and doesn't really have a process like the other states. And um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Brian Goodyear. Um, he is a psychologist and he will talk to you about the mental health evaluation. Thank you, Sam, and aloha to everybody. Uh, as Sam said, the Hawaii law is rather unique. Dr. Goodyear, we're having we're a little having bit of little trouble bit hearing, you. hearing you. Okay. Um, we, you might want to try, you could try turning off your video, which I know is unfortunate. We'd love to see you, but sometimes we can hear people better when the video is not on. Or maybe there's uh, something with your microphone. You want to try again? Here, you're on mute, Dr. Goodyear. Can you hear me now? It's still it's a little still choppy, but we can try. try. Okay. Um, I have to apologize, but my voice is a little bit uh, problematic right now. Um, that may be part of the problem. I'll try to speak as loud as I can, and hopefully I will get through. Um, as Sam has said, the Hawaii law is unique in a number of ways, actually. In Hawaii, all patients who request medical aid in dying must be referred by a physician for what the law describes as counseling. And counseling is defined as one or more consultations with a licensed psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker. And uh, the evaluation by a counselor, according to the law, has to determine that the patient is capable I mean, it has the mental capacity. And also, uh, this is something else that is unique to the way the patient does not appear to be suffering from under treatment or non treatment of depression or other conditions which may interfere with the patient's ability to make an informed decision. Um, next slide. Are you hearing all of it? Um, the, the components of the mental health evaluation 
Um, this is the procedure that I have basically come to adopt um, in the evaluation that I have done so far. First of all, a, a review of the relevant medical records. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go back and review the patient's entire medical history, but a review of the relevant medical records. Dr. Gander, so, I'm, I'm really yeah. sorry to interrupt you. It's very difficult to understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, I, I apologize. I'm not sure maybe, um, I don't know if Dr. Miller or someone else might want to jump in and try to help with, I can try to, I, I mean, I can try to say what I think you're saying as well. So, uh, is this Samantha, can you stay on me? Yeah. Yeah. But I think Dr. Goodyear, do you want to try again? I just heard you for a second. Yeah. Is this any better? That's a million times better. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I had to switch microphones there. So, okay. Um, yeah, I apologize for that. So um, to just go through this again briefly, um, what, what I do in the course of my evaluations, I start off by reviewing medic, uh, relevant medical records. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go through the entire medical record of the patient, but I think it is important to review um, those records that are relevant to the patient's decision. Uh, review of available mental health records, if any are available. Um, a clinical interview with the patient, um, which is sort of a semi-structured interview. Um, it would include um, a mental capacity evaluation, uh, a mental status um, uh, evaluation, and um, I also use a little checklist that I uh, based on an instrument called the Aid to Capacity Evaluation, which I found very helpful. And um, then when you've gone through all of that, the completion of the Department of Health form, and then uh, a detailed clinical report to go into the patient's chart. Thank you, Dr. Goodyear. And if anyone has questions for Dr. Goodyear, again, you can put your questions in the Q&A box at any time and he can answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, next, we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Groob. Uh, aloha from Oregon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in today's uh, panel discussion. Um, there is a There are other components that aren't written down but are so important and as I will always say, I think that social workers have played a, a huge role uh, in the valuation uh, of these patients and in responding to their needs, wishes, and values. I did want to make this one point, though, that while uh, there were a number of times when I wrote a prescription for aid and dying for my patients, I always offered to be present at the time of their ingestion, which was, of course, much easier than it probably is in Hawaii. But interestingly to me, um, if they wanted someone to be present at the time of ingestion, it generally was not their physician, it was the nurse, the hospice nurse. That's who they would like to have present with them uh, almost universally. Um, so this may be something that is uh, not yet a policy in your um, uh, system that you work in, but would be something to uh, strive for. And I just wanna make the point about the value of hospice nurses uh, in this process. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Groob. Next, we're gonna turn it over to Susan Amina and Jody Shaw. Hi, aloha everybody. Um, this is Jody Shaw and I'm a social worker with Kaiser in the Oncology Clinic. And um, so Susan and I are the navigators for, at, at Kaiser we call it the medical aid and dying option or program. Um, and Kaiser you know, really was forward thinking when, when the law was passed and um, they, all, all these different representatives from different departments um, started to get together and, and talk and plan and um, put into, into place the, the process and, um, you know, how this would all work with, for the patient and family and to make it as smooth as possible. Um, 
So for Kaiser, how it works is that it all begins with the, the patient talking to their doctor. It could be their primary care doctor or their, um, or their specialist, like the oncologist, and um, you know, asking them if they meet the requirements or, or you know, finding more about it, finding out more about it. Um, and then once they are determined to meet the qualifications, then the doctor would make a referral through Health Connect, and Susan and I would receive um, that referral. And then we take turns uh, with the cases. And um, so Susan is an APRN and I'm a social worker. And, um, you know, but we both help the patient to navigate through the process and take them through all the different steps, help them with the forms. Um, and then we also, you know, partner and coordinate with the doctors to, to get all of the visits done. Um, and I, I have to, let me step back to and when we do first meet with the patient, um, and family, we meet with them and really try to get to know them and, you know, what what is motivating them to, you know, to choose this option. But then also at the same time, it's, it's an incredible opportunity for us to really fully explore, um, you know, what are the patient's wishes? What are their fears? Um, and then at the same time, taking that opportunity to talk about all of the different uh, supports and resources like um, you know Sam and, and Dr. Group mentioned, um, such as hospice. We always encourage hospice hand in hand with choosing this option. And I have to say, I think for most of our patients, they have had hospice on board and we've worked you know, in partnership very closely with them to support these patients and families and you know, their support and um, experience is invaluable. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, so the, basically the patient, you know, just needs to talk to the doctor to get things started. We get the referral, we'll walk them through the process. And, um, and especially now that the, the visits can be done by phone, you know, we can get them through it pretty quick in, in 21 days, um, usually. Um, and I also wanted to, we wanted to share a few stories too. Um, of some of these experiences. So you kind of get a, a feel for it, um, you know, on a, a per personal level. So let me share with you um, one of our patients from our first year. His name was Paul, and he was a 73-year-old gentleman uh, diagnosed with, with ALS. And he had been diagnosed when he was 71 years old. Um, and he was a very active, independent, fun-loving gentleman who loved his wife, you know, dearly and his family and he enjoyed doing outdoor activities with him. He had actually been a carpenter and really enjoyed building and fixing things. Um, so it was so difficult because slowly, little by little, he was able to do less and less of what he loved and you know, doing act active activities and, and building things. And he knew um, for himself that when he was diagnosed that he did not want a feeding tube or a ventilator and um, he hoped for the passage of the Our Care, Our Choice Act um, because he was diagnosed um, originally in 2017. Um, and he hoped you know, it would pass so that he could, he could choose when, where, and how he would take his final breath. Um, he'd also partnered with his neurologist from the start and you know, let him know that this is what he wanted to do if it became available. So in March, um, in March of 2019, um, he actually began the process um, with his neurologist, and um, you know, and they contacted us to start the process. Um, I was the coordinator for um, for Paul, and so I met with him and his wife, and and then took him through the different required steps and arranged the different visits with the attending consulting mental health provider. And then the medication was, um, you know, he met all the requirements, did the forms, and the medication was then um, dispensed by Jake at Elex RX. And we're so thankful, you know, we've really partnered with Jake from the start um, to help a lot of these patients. Um, so it was dispensed um, on mid-April. And um, he planned, you know, this with his wife on when he would take it. And so what he did was he invited his his children over, one from the mainland, one from the big island, and um, with their grandchildren as well. And they had a wonderful weekend together, um, spent a lot of quality time, did a lot of reminiscing and life review. 
And then the next day, um, he and his wife, together with a close friend and a hospice nurse, gathered in his yard. And um, he laid out comfortably on a chase recliner uh, with the, a blanket that his wife had chosen for him. Um, they, they listened to Beatles music and sang. And um, he, they shared that he watched the birds eating his papayas. Um, and then he took the medication. Uh, he fell asleep within a few minutes and he passed peace peacefully in about 45 minutes or so. Um, and then I spoke to the wife several times after and she was just so thankful for, um, for the team, you know, the care team that made this happen as well as, you know, to the Hawaii State Legislature for passing this option and making it available to Paul and to her so that he could leave the earth, you know, the way he wanted to. And at the time he wanted to do that. Um, so that was, yeah, and we've seen so many patients that they've really, and families, they've made this um, sort of a, a ceremony and a party at the end and a celebration of their life. And then I just add one, want to add one more thing before passing it over to Susan. Um, I want to add to that for, for Kaiser, um, so I'm the social worker in the oncology clinic, but there's, um, Kaiser's really wonderful and recognizes the, the value of social workers. So there are social workers throughout the whole system and um, such as at the clinics or um, in the hospital. And so you can always, you know, ask for a social worker to work with you and, and partner with you on, um, on this or, you know, any other, other needs that you have too. And then I'd like to pass it over now to Susan. I think you're on mute, Susan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Jody, for that. Um, so I wanted to share with you this story, and part of it is to illustrate the role of the navigator, whether it's a nurse or a social worker. And it gets interesting in terms of family dynamics and this gentleman's history of depression. So 64-year-old diagnosed with Parkinson's about 20 years ago. Um, interesting, he was diagnosed the same year his mother died from Parkinson's which he describes as being a very difficult death. Um, Larry was a surgeon. He retired because of his Parkinson. Um, he did have a suicide attempt in 2015, was followed actively by behavioral health, both a psychiatrist and psychologist, as well as um, medication and psychotherapy for depression. And at the end of this, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Goodyear chime in because he was actually the one that evaluated Larry. Um, so this gentleman was very well versed with the Hawaii state law. Um, he, had, he actually had investigated medical aid in dying when he was first diagnosed many years ago. Um, family dynamics, so two daughters, both in Hawaii. One actually was estranged since 2015. Um, the other one, per the wife, when spoke to the daughter, she was really at peace with her father's decision. Um, the second daughter actually um, asked for my phone number to, to talk to me. Um, and, and as I explained to the wife, I, I'm happy to talk to her in terms of the process, but in terms of the details with her father, obviously I would need consent. I, I never received consent in, in, that, in terms of that. Um, again, as I said, he's being treated as well for depression. Um, before I met him, about a month before, he actually moved into a retirement center because his wife could no longer care for him. Um, and then Soon after moving in, staff actually heard him talking about trying to order a scalpel online. Um, he did have a caretaker, actually a couple caretakers that, that worked closely with him and one that was very close to him. Um, the first visit with me, um, I actually, in terms of care coordination, right, I tried to coordinate it so that he saw me, uh, the attending physician, which was a neurologist, and then the consulting, which was Dr. Miller, all on the same day just because this gentleman, you know, tired easily, was in a wheelchair, so, so to make it as easy as possible. I think hopefully with all the visits I have, whether it be the initial or follow-up, you should not be able to detect my opinion. Um, I, I really try to be non-judgmental and really neutral. Obviously, if I had strong reservations against this, I might not be in this role, but nonetheless, I, I appear to be very neutral in terms of this being one of many options. Um, 
the, you know, in, in terms of Jody's point, in terms of moving fairly quickly, I mean, we're always very cognizant of the uh, health of the individual and the prognosis. So I think we always try to move as quickly as we can. And, and again, we're in a system that allows us to actually be able to do that. And then in this case, of course, you know, the concern is, is his swallowing going to worsen? And, and how quickly might that happen? Um, a week later, he saw Dr. Goodyear. Um, and I'll leave it to Dr. Goodyear when we're all done to talk about his interaction with him. Um, I was on family medical leave when actually Jody received a voice message from that daughter number two asking to talk to the providers about this, this situation. And she was concerned that one, she said her parents always kind of hid the history of her father's suicide attempt in the past and that she believed the father didn't meet criteria because of his history of depression. Um, you know, and again, as a team, Jody obviously read my note. Um, she talked with legal as well. Um, and again, explained to the wife that we would need an ROI, which we never did receive. The wife was actually very comfortable proceeding because of her experience and her husband's experience with mental health providers and the evaluation with Dr. Goodyear. Um, and it's interesting, once he actually completed all three of the provider visits and then was waiting for that second verbal request that was soon to happen, he actually became much brighter, much more engaged, um, a real transition in terms of the reassurance that he's got an option, that he has a choice and it, to end his life as, as he chose. Um, to go back to to a minute. So it gets a little more complicated. The caretaker sends a note to Kaiser expressing her disagreement with his decision. And she specifically said, do not share this obviously with the wife or with Larry. And so she then had a number of reasons why this should not happen, um, which is really kind of interesting. So how we dealt with that was the attending actually wrote her back a letter saying that, no, you know, thank you for your opinion or your concern, but you know what? We can't comprehend another person's suffering. And as though it appears to you that this is really, not, no, he, this is his choice. This is what he wants to do. Um, so that was kind of an interesting um, sideline on that. Um, the wife was very thoughtful. Um, she did not want to play a role in it in terms of mixing meds. So Larry's brother participated or agreed to participate as mixing it. Um, I had a number of conversations with the wife after he picked up the medication, and it was all around, very interestingly, how very difficult this decision is for Larry. He kept postponing the decision in terms of when to take it, despite past suicide attempts. Um, she always she described him as really having a zest for life, um, but yet did not want to experience the death that his mother did. Um, and it was really apparent how very difficult it is for patients, not only Larry, but many others, to make this decision. Um, she did not want to appear to be coercing Larry in any way. She was fabulous in terms of trying to juggle all these other opinions and yet honor his decision. And there was also some disagreement from his extended family. Um, so after you know, receiving the medication, he actually took a, a trip out of state to visit his family and to visit sites that were important to him. The brother at that point said, you know what, the window may be narrowing because of the difficulty with, with swallowing. And of course, the, the, the wife was very grateful that that, that conversation took place. Um, so he enrolled, his decision was to enroll in hospice because he was in the retirement center with a number of caretakers right before he were to take the medication. So he did. Um, he had an outing to the zoo, and a few days later, he took the medication. But just very interesting in terms of um, watching the wife, in terms of how she had to maneuver and deal with, with various individuals, um, and the fact that despite past suicide attempts, he had such a very difficult time on when to take the medication. Um, so really interesting. Um, I found it to be a really interesting case. And, and I'll defer to Dr. Goodyear at this point, just because Again, it gets a bit more complicated when you've got that history of depression. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And Dr. Goodyear, we'd love to hear from you briefly. I do want to just um, note the time. We have about 25 minutes left. Okay, I'll try to keep it relatively brief. 
Um, this was a rather difficult case compared with most of the cases that I've seen uh, because of his history. Um, despite that history, um, and I will say also he readily admitted when I saw him that uh, he was depressed. And, and I thought that was quite understandable given his situation. His mobility was extremely limited. He had difficulty communicating. Um, he had um, bilateral deep brain stimulators, which had to be turned off in order for him to communicate verbally. Um, but he was able to communicate uh, his history very clearly, and he was able to communicate um, why he wanted to have medical aid in dying available. And um, to cut a long story short, although he had this history of depression, um, I, I felt that the depression um, did not uh, interfere with his ability to make an informed decision. So um, I was um, quite willing to clear him to go ahead with the process. Thank you for that explanation, Dr. Goodyear. Um, we have another story now that Michelle Quintillo from Hawaii Pacific Health is going to share. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Susan, Dr. Goodyear, and Jody for sharing those stories. Those are very important. and. I'm just sending out loving kindness to that patient's wife and family because that, that was a difficult um, case. Um, I just wanted to share Judy's story. She's one of our patients and she has given us authorization of HPH to use her story for education as well as compassion and choices. Um, Judy has, um, she was some to, some to seven years old when she passed. She had breast cancer diagnosed in 2010 and then she was in remission. And then within the last couple of years, uh, she had a mass that went to her heart and to her auxiliary area where she lost function in her arm and, and really um, had a terrible uh, a wound on her upper left area. She looked, she did reach out to see if the, 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 the mass could be re removed from, by her heart and it was inoperable. She came, she was admitted, uh, not, she had a consult for palliative care back in May, 2018. And with that visit, um, just a little bit more history about Judy. She actually came from, from Connecticut, um, came to Hawaii in 1959, and she loved Hawaii. In Hawaii, she said, a good day and a perfect day in Hawaii, this beautiful sunny day, her friends, laughter, friend, drinking wine, good music. She was the lover of music. She was a piano teacher. Uh, she loved cooking. She wrote cookbooks. She did cooking webinars as well as real estate. She was into professional development. She did it all. She was married three times, had one daughter, um, she was not close to, but at the end she was, got closer. And um, her, last, her last husband passed away with cancer um, and he died under the hospice care in, in Hawaii. And of, regarding cancer, she said to the palliative care physician, cancer is a thief. It robs you of the pleasures one by one. This was not her first experience with cancer. Her mother also died of breast cancer uh, a, a couple over uh, decades ago. And her mother's request back in the mainland was, hey, Judy, can you, um, I'm interested in this death with dignity law. Is this something I could do? Unfortunately, at that time, that was not legal within the state. So she could not proceed with it. When Judy did see the palliative care physician, Dr. Manai, Back in 2018, she said to her, you know, I'm not really interested in medical aid and dying. I don't, I think I want to die naturally. However, one of our homework from palliative care was to journal and true and journal every day. And through her explorations, medical aid and dying came in more into her and she wanted to do more research with us about it. Um, and then she also did her own research and became a member of the Hemlock Society. And another journey for her was really to reach out to her PCP or oncologist um, of, of would they participate in medical aid in dying. Um, half 50-50, the one who did not participate, didn't, didn't push her aside, listened to her, explore her wishes, was very compassionate and says, you know what, I'm not going to participate, but I'm going to get the help for you. 
and then he reached out to us, to me as a, a, a ACP coordinator, and I helped facilitate medical aid and dying processes uh, for Hawaii Pacific Health. And um, one of the requests for Judy that is, is she was in a senior living facility. At the senior living facility, she was a little bit hesitant to ask them about permission to use the medical aid in dying law. So she said to her doctor, can you check and see if they would do it? Um, so that was another homework that we had to do for Judy and which we did. And to um, thankfully uh, the, the senior facility not only embraced Judy's wishes, they, they, we reached out to them, we did education. I thought the education would, would just be with the nurse and the social worker who's taking care of her. But when we had the Zoom class, because this was this year during COVID times, it was a whole room filled with the administrators and leadership. And that says that was powerful. That, that, said, that was awesome. Um, with, with that, um, her education with medical aid and dying, um, her another request to was hospice. And she wanted to know back in 2019, hey, which hospice would be available at the bedside? We kind of knew of one or two hospices, but because it was so early, we said, Judy, it's important you do your own education and well and reach out to all the hospices to see who serves you best and best for your needs. Um, another request was Judy was, she was our first patient to do, um, to get chaplain on board because we don't have an outpatient chaplain. So we, the inpatient chaplain did offer his services and met with her. Um, we also, her homework was we got her involved with UH Will Body Program. She actually even went ahead to write a letter to the residents for a year later after they do the celebration. Also homework to us um, was working with debt doulas, something new to her. She's like, what is debt doulas? So she um, did um, work with one of the debt doulas for her end of life care and planning and preparing. So basically um, working and collaboration as a team was so very important. The week before she decided to take her medication, we collaborated not only with the senior living facility, with the hospice services, we collaborated um, with the physician was on board, the, the attending physician, the debt doulas. And at that time, her healthcare pub attorney and her good friend was willing to mix the medication, but she really got nervous at the end. And so we had to have another meeting with that smaller group. And we went, kind of went through and say, Who's the, who was the backup if her friend could not do it? And thankfully, um, we had an end of life um, uh, Washington volunteer that just moved to Hawaii. And we we're like, hey, we have somebody to help support you. The debt doula was willing to do that as well. But, but his job was also to make everything perfect for Judy, which was to have champagne for the limited friends she can have during COVID to have the, her plumeria flowers, to have the music of, of Kamehameha music, class of 55. So, so it was all an orchestra and a balancing act of everybody coming together. Um, and then when she did take her, um, her medicine, uh, it was at sunrise that she requested. And um, the senior living facility, because she had that small number of friends and her daughter that was very important to her and the, the, the staff, as well as the doctor be present in the hospice, um, they made room to have a separate room next to Judy's apartment, that empty place that people could slowly come and say their goodbyes to her. And so she took the medication she, um, and she, she was asleep within five minutes and passed within 25 minutes with the medication. So her lessons to us is she taught us not to be afraid to explore, especially for medical aid and dying and what's important. So exploration and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for sharing Judy's story, Michelle. Um, I, you know, I apologize. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, Laura, can you give us an update on telehealth and telemedicine from the Department of Health? Sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me and for inviting me here today. Um, and I, I just want to say that I really appreciate the stories because I, I'm a very social person. And what I get is I'm the person that collects the paperwork <laughs> and crunch the numbers. Um, and so it really adds a nice, beautiful layer of colors to um, the documents that I receive. and 
having to look through these to um, just document it for the department. Um, I'll reiterate that we don't have a budget for this. So this is very manual process for me, um, looking through the paperwork. So um, let's just go forward on the slide. I can give a quick update on telehealth. Thanks, we're gonna skip ahead to slide 26, Christina. Oh, okay, right here, perfect. I, I, you could do the poll, Sam, if you would like to, that's fine. I think we're gonna run out of time okay. and I, I love the stories too. I think they're really so important. So don't worry about it. Just if you wanna go ahead and give your update, that's fine. Right, okay. So with telehealth, as you know, telehealth really skyrocketed during this time. And it was really to um, enable access for patients and providers while minimizing infections, right? Um, and so there were quite a bit of changes in the policies that restricted telehealth prior to COVID. So um, changes and waivers. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple things that are applicable to providers um, in this um, for our care, our choice and providers in general. Um, you know, prior to COVID, uh, in general, the, the primary mode of telehealth is audio and visual. Um, one of the waivers was to include phone and that was just a real, just purely for access. Um, some folks don't have broadband, some folks have unreliable broadband, um, and, and some patients just don't have enough data in their plan to be able to um, do an audio and visual um, telehealth visit. So likely to discontinue is telephone um, that's audio via telehealth. Um, and then also prior to COVID, um, there were limitations in terms of originating sites. So you would think logically, you know, we'd be able to do telehealth to the patient's home. Um, but there are um, restrictions there prior to COVID. You could only do telehealth to a patient that lives in a rural area. Uh, and so during COVID, it was opened up and now you, you know, basically could do telehealth to the patient's home in rural and non-rural areas. So post COVID likely to discontinue to non-rural areas, it'll probably revert back um, in, in terms of the originating sites to patients um, only in rural areas in their home. Another waiver, and this makes sense completely is a HIPAA waiver. Um, privacy waivers. So that will likely end. Um, during this time with COVID, providers can use non-public facing apps like FaceTime, Skype, and DoxyMe. Um, after COVID, that will go away. That will revert back to um, requirements for HIPAA. Uh, another waiver is um, during COVID, providers from out of state um, waivers around credentialing and privileging requirements. As long as the provider is hired by a state uh, or local entity or facility in Hawaii, um, credentialing and privileging can be waived. Um, but after COVID, likely that will discontinue as well. So that waiver. Um, what we're seeing and discussions are still sort of ongoing is, and I think it's gonna be really important even post COVID, during COVID is um, seeing patients, mental health providers seeing new uh, and established patients. Um, right now, providers, mental health providers can see new patients and established patients, but post COVID, new patients might go away. So we'll see, um, that's something to watch. Um, and with Hawaii, I think it's very important um, uh, because we have a shortage of mental health providers in the state, um, quite simply. And as we get to the data on um, the numbers for um, counseling providers, you'll see we just have one neighbor island that's participating. Majority of the mental health providers are located on Oahu. So telehealth for new patients on the neighbor island um, and post COVID, that access is gonna be somewhat restricted for, for patients. Um, what else do we have? Okay, expanded coverage to, uh, with Medicare, Medicaid, and private payers. Um, 
that is related to identifying new eligible providers that can now do telehealth, like occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists. Um, jury still out on that, um, but not really applicable to this group. I just wanted to note that there is um, expanded coverage for Medicare, Medicaid, private payers. So take a look at, at that, watch, watch the changes there. Um, we are seeing funding for broadband and workforce development coming into the state. Um, so if you have a patient or provider that has very limited access, no access to broadband, anticipate in the future that there will be more broadband access across the state. Um, and during COVID, we, uh, I mean, really highlighted the digital gaps um, in Hawaii patients and students just switching to online and, um, you know, their uh, awareness and knowledge uh, of digital tools are very challenging to teachers and I'm sure um, for healthcare providers as well, reaching out to patients, just learning how to navigate web pages and logins and so forth. So um, there is a group um, called the Broadband Hui that's working on bridging this digital equity gap to help folks um, get the basic skills in utilizing digital tools. So that will help um, healthcare providers and working with patients to do telehealth. So we anticipate um, improvement in um, our community and understanding technology, uh, um, basic you know, use of technology. Um, telework. So one of the major challenges in retaining providers in Hawaii is our high cost of living. Um, with the adoption of telehealth gaining traction, not only in Hawaii, but across our nation and the fact that not just Hawaii, we're dealing with shortages, it's, it, it's across the board nationwide, we're dealing with shortages. Um, but this will enable providers, because this is one of the number one cited things in Hawaii. They'll come to Hawaii, they'll stay in Hawaii for a few years and then they'll leave because it's just too darn expensive. <laughs> and so with telework, this allows providers to just, you know, they don't need to live on Oahu where housing is so expensive. They could live on the neighbor islands and be able to do telehealth and, and telework. And so um, I'm hoping that this will continue this. We're on a good track right now in terms of telework and telehealth together. Um, organizational systems and processes. So there was a huge transition of health systems going into telehealth. Um, providers are telling me, you know, they're, they're pretty comfortable with telehealth in general uh, and patients are getting there as well. But now they know what they want. Now they know what works, what doesn't work, and so I'm anticipating more tweaking here in terms of systems. Um, and I'm anticipating patient demand to continue because of the convenience um, and adoption of telehealth due to COVID. Um, and so I'm hearing from the neighbor island providers that they know that patients are gonna want telehealth. And so they're making um, uh, ways in which um, patients can access telehealth. So they're they're networking more with other providers on island, like for example, Hawaii Island, you know, Hamakua networking with Kona, networking with Ka'u and so forth. So that's really um, good to see when providers um, connect with each other to address their island needs um, besides, you know, reaching out to Oahu. But uh, so that's the update for telehealth. If anybody has questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, we're going to hear some stories now about telehealth in action. First up, we have Dr. Charles Miller. Oh, how about now? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, when the, um, the COVID emergency was started in March, uh, Kaiser went to basically no face-to-face -face patient uh, physician interaction, um, and except obviously for certain patients who required it, like chemotherapy patients. But for the patients who requested aid in dying, um, telehealth worked great. And we had uh, 
Susan probably has some data on this, but uh, ever since March, we have been doing um, usually just telephone as attending or consulting physician. And uh, the patients, I, I have to say this, the patients have been very satisfied. Uh, they like it because they don't have to take a trip into the, the clinic or the hospital. Um, just as an aside, I, for patients on Oahu and some even on the big the outer islands, uh, I always, before the COVID pandemic, I always want, made it my, my aim to actually go and see the patient in person at their home. That stopped, um, but I have to say the patients were totally um, they're very satisfied with telehealth and the, the communications. And part of that was because Kaiser system he, with uh, Susan and Jody, they would always send out the necessary information and data forms and everything. Uh, usually the patient had that in hand before I actually talked to them. So it worked very well. And I know Brian has had uh, similar experience with uh, the mental health counseling. So go ahead, Brian. Thanks, Chuck. Um, yeah, very similar experience. Um, I, I used to, prior to COVID, try to go to patients' homes or uh, assisted living facilities, wherever they were at. I thought that was the best way really to meet with them. Um, so it was a little bit of a switch to go to telehealth. Actually, it's it's gone a lot more smoothly than uh, than I thought it would. Um, as Chuck said, most of the patients seem quite comfortable um, with the telehealth procedure. I also have done most of mine by telephone, and um, I'll usually call up the day before and give them a choice of either doing it by phone or doing it by video. And so far, all of them have just chosen to do it by phone. And uh, it's, it's worked just fine. Great. Um, I'm Dr. Charlotte Sharfin. And as Sam said, I'm actually an emergency physician, 20 years, and I live on the Big Island. But I started a nonprofit called Life and Death Wellness uh, to educate and support uh, people at the end of their life. And that's how my first patient found me in 2019. And that, of course, was done completely in person. And then 2020 rolls around and everything switches. And um, this year, I've actually had four patients come to me, all new patients, and each one of them I took through uh, telemedicine. And I have to say, I was actually a little bit skeptical at first. I was actually stranded in Florida when the pandemic hit. So I was about 7,000 miles away from the patient that was requesting my help. Um, I got a referral from North Hawaii Hospice and from this patient's end of life doula. And I feel very comfortable with telemed. I've used it in the ER and outside of it, but I was skeptical because of the connectivity. And I don't just mean Wi-Fi. I mean, was I able, was I going to be able to really get in and and connect with that patient on a deep level. Um, that's really important for me when I'm doing this process. And I will just tell you, I was pleasantly surprised that I think that connection can be actually even deeper uh, than being in person. And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, clearly there's the safety and there's the distance issue that we get to uh, avoid. But the other thing that the patients get to avoid is exacerbating their physical symptoms, their pain, their shortness of breath, their weakness, their nausea, whatever it may be. Um, but there's also something else I think that happens and they are in their own safety zone as are the physicians. Usually when a patient's meeting me, they're meeting me for the first time, they're meeting a stranger. So being able to be in their own home um, actually I think allows every one of the patients I've used this with to open up maybe even on a, on a more deeper level, which I love. So the patient gets to feel safe and heard. Um, in my practice, I have really tried when I'm taking someone through the process to do video. I like to be able to see their face. I like to be able to see their body language. 
it also allows me to really be able to assess how how they're if they're deteriorating or not. Um, and so if I can use the video, I always try to. I've only had one patient where I've had to do a combo, and that was because he was on the helo side with pretty um, pretty limited access. But I am hopeful, especially for such a rural island that we get to continue to use telemedicine for medical aid in dying because it certainly decreases the barriers for um, end of life options, especially on a rural place. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharp, and thank you everybody for your stories. We have another quick poll question. Although the law is statewide, which islands have the Our Care, Our Choice Act patients lived on? So give it your best shot. If we can launch that poll. Here we go. So let me read it again. Although the law is statewide, which islands have the Our Care, Our Choice Act patients lived on? And you can choose more than one option. So take your best guess. This is kind of a question, you know, is this truly accessible um, on every island? Okay, I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds to vote. And let's go ahead and share those results. Alrighty, some pretty good guesses there. We think most people um, are on Oahu, the island of Hawaii. We do know Dr. Sharfin is one doctor who prescribes, but it's a pretty big island. Um, let's go ahead and find the answers. Can you go to the next slide, Christina? So most Our Care, Our Choice Act patients have lived on Ho Oahu. However, over the last 18 months, there have been patients on Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island who have been able to access the law, but I will tell you here at Compassion and Choices, we do get calls often from patients on neighbor islands who are having problems accessing the law. I know, um, especially in Hilo, there's, I, I'm not sure there are any doctors who are allowed to prescribe there. So it can still be very challenging. All right, now we're gonna do an update on the numbers and um, we're gonna start with Laura, who's gonna talk to us about the data from the Department of Health. Okay, thanks, Sam. For the most part, I, I would just say that overall, um, there's no notable changes from our last report in terms of the recommendations. Recommendations is still the same, authorizing APRNs to service, serve as APs, attending providers, and two waiving um, waiting periods if the attending provider and um, consulting provider agree that the patient death is likely. Um, prior to the end of the waiting period. And so um, I was able to update the numbers, the numbers, um, 63 patients. Um, this is the first school year in 2019 and up until October 28th, uh, 33 patients. So a total of 63 patients um, and uh, 23 patients died, 15 patients ingested made in 2019. And in 2020, the totals are looking um, like this, 30 patients died and 21 ingested made. Um, I'm sure envelopes are still coming in, but this was uh, the last time I was in the office. Um, the most cited underlying illness um, is related to cancer. The majority of patients are over 65 with private insurance, white and male. Um, the numbers really haven't changed too much in terms of the um, First oral request to prescription, 2019, 35 days. Average waiting period from the first to the second oral request is 27 days. So that's what, that was in 2019. And then 2020, we're kind of up a little bit in terms of 42 days between um, first oral request to prescription. And then of course, 29 days um, average waiting period. I will say again that networking amongst private practicing providers is gonna be really key for patients in terms of access. Large organizations are well-networked and providers in the community here um, are well-networked. And I noticed the numbers are much tighter. Uh, the turnaround is much quicker, um, but the, the longer days, the wait times is, is longer with private practicing providers. Thank you, Laura. I do, I am curious why it's taking longer in 2020 than 2019. So maybe at the end when we get to the discussion, 
um, if the, you know, if the presenters can think about why that might be, or if you have an answer, Laura. Well, this is, you know, I think what the outliers and sort of changes the numbers really are the private practicing for um, physicians. Um, for the most part, um, the large organizations and those that are networked here, then the timeline is much tighter. Um, so uh, I think that's what's changing the numbers is as more private practicing providers come on board and are learning a process, they may be taking a bit longer. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And um, statewide access, I wanted to just, um, you know, indicate the number of providers that are participating um, in the islands um, for 2019 through 2020. You know, we've got um, 20 providers, attending providers. What is this? Did I make a distinction between 2019? No, I didn't. These are totals. So <laughs> it's all the way from January 2019 to now. Um, this is what we're looking like in terms of provider access. 20 attending providers, 22 consulting providers that could potentially be attending providers, um, and then 15 counseling providers um, statewide. So I'm going to encourage telehealth, especially during this time when the waivers are in place. Um, I'm not really sure how um, after COVID, but I hope that at the policy congressional level, they recognize that folks are going to need mental health services, especially with all of these lockdowns. So um, I'm hoping that we could um, continue uh, access for counseling providers statewide. Okay, next slide. Um, just a, a few comments in terms of what I'm seeing in receiving the documents. Um, I, I don't need the final attestation that could be kept with the attending provider. Um, I am seeing, and this is with, again, the private practicing providers um, in lieu of the counseling form and the consulting form, I've had at least two follow-ups um, to ensure that I get the, uh, that I receive the forms, the required forms that are on the DOH website. I'm not a medical provider. I, you know, these forms were created to ensure that the patient meets um, eligibility. And so with the forms completed and it checks all the boxes, um, you know, the patient is qualified. So um, there's just been a few, I would say about two that have um, submitted alternate um, forms to replace the required forms. Um, and one-sided complication, I think the group here is aware of um, that from the previous webinar that we had, but I wanted to make note of that here for the new folks that are joining us on the webinar. And I received this information from um, Dr. Miller um, in regards to this one patient uh, that took longer than the typical four hours within the, the guidelines. And so he was able to provide some sort of, I guess, red flags, you could call it, um, where the patient did not have any um, comorbidities. The patient was young and was very large. Uh, ethnicity was Samoan. So um, uh, the patient just took longer than, than expected. Um, there was one death certificate that came in, and I was surprised that it was even, it came across my desk, but the, the provider indicated that the patient took May medical aid and dime prescription, um, as opposed to the underlying illness. So we were able to address that, but I can't say for sure that, you know, every time we're going to be able to catch these things. Um, we do get, I believe it was 5,000 to 8,000 requests a day for copies of certificates and things. So staff are really overwhelmed in our vital records office. So I just wanna emphasize that for new providers and you know, to make sure that it is the underlying illness that's cited for the death certificate, um, encourage providers to network as much as possible, reach out to your providers on the neighbor islands, connect with folks, 
food because they may be receiving patients that are inquiring about um, MAID and then a, a, a reminder that the forms are available on the DOH's website. And, and these are required forms to be submitted. Um, you could just Google our Care Our Choice Act and our webpage will, will pop up. So that's all I have for, for this slide. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I'd like to point out too, we do have a listserv of medical providers in Hawaii who have practiced medical aid in dying. So if you have a question or a patient who's having problems finding a doctor, please reach out to us and we can email the network of doctors and um, nurses and social workers. Uh, and they've been really efficient in, um, in helping people. So um, you can always reach out to us. Um, I gotta add too that, you know, keeping in line with all of the other states that have authorized medical aid and in dying, including Oregon that's had it for over 20 years, there hasn't been a single incident of coercion or abuse. The only problems we're hearing about um, really are patients who are, are having problems getting through the process to access the law. Um, now we're going to go through the data that Kaiser and um, Hawaii Pacific Health has released, and we, these are repeats from part one. So if um, Susan and Dr. Miller, if you want to just go over the highlights, since I think most of the participants today were, um, were part of part one, um, that would be great. Uh, sure. I, well, I think, you know, the, the, the number of referrals has held fairly steady, although I must say in the last month or so, uh, they have dropped off. Uh, you, I'm not going to go through this. Most of the patients are cancer. Uh, second is uh, neurodegenerative diseases and then uh, lung disease. Uh, we have uh, Big Island Maui, uh, about the same. And um, the ineligible out of what, 76 referrals, only five have been ineligible. Um, and thankfully, uh, Susan or, or uh, Jody uh, pick up on this pretty quickly, when, especially if the, the prognosis is, you know, you, you, you got a lot more than six months to go. So um, I guess the one thing that uh, bothered me the most during this almost two years now is the fact that if you look at the bottom of the slide, 12 patients, these are Kaiser patients, 12 died in the 20 day window, um, which shouldn't happen. It's, I know, I know the patients are partly uh, at fault because they wait so long, but is that shouldn't that still shouldn't prevent them from having access to what they feel is their choice. And um, I just want to reemphasize: we got to get that thing passed through the legislature where it allows the uh, consulting and attending physician to waive that waiting period if, in their clinical judgment, the patient won't last 20 days. And that's all I'll say. Susan, anything to add? Uh, just, just to add, in terms of that 20-day waiting period, and we've tried to do a lot of education with our providers, is sometimes what we're finding is we're getting referrals too late. Um, you know, we're getting referrals and the patient's gravely ill when they were actually talking about mental pain and dying with a provider months or a year before. So part of it is also just getting providers to refer to us earlier and, and not wait. Thank you, Susan. And I will mention the, the legislation that um, it didn't make it through the legislature this year because of the pandemic, but it will be um, filed again in 2021. Um, they want to make the same amendment that Oregon's made, which would allow the attending provider the ability to waive the mandatory minimum waiting period if the patient is not likely to survive it. The patient would still have to meet all of the other qualifications. So that is legislation that we're trying to um, hopefully get passed in Hawaii. Did you want to say anything about this slide? I know it's a repeat from part one. Okay, Jody. Um, so I think I talked about a lot of these things earlier, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, basically um, Kaiser set up, you know, a whole system in place. And I think 
over the two years, things have really tightened up. So we are usually able to, you know, if we get a timely referral, able to get the person through the process pretty quickly, and they're able to get the medication theoretically within 21 days. Um, just to very much appreciate the partnership with the hospices. And then we're trying to also, um, but we're also having more uh, physician participation amongst our providers, um, you know, some more um, PCPs and some specialists are becoming um, attending or consulting physicians. Yeah, and then since it's going to review the, the last four. So a couple, a couple really big changes is, you know, we were dispensing, you know, through Jake, who's been wonderful. The, the problem is we were having neighbor island patients having to fly over to pick up a prescription or their family member, which was really difficult um, for them. So now we actually are able to dispense on the neighbor island. So Kona, Hilo, and uh, Wailuku all now can dispense the drug. So, so much easier for patients. You know, we transitioned from DDPM2 to DDMA. You know, we, again, we were seeing deaths could be two to four hours and that one case was six. DDMA, now we're looking at 10 minutes to about 40. So huge change, you know, clinically and obviously a much benefit to the family members that are witnessing that death. And then of course, one of the other changes is Quest um, in Hawaii will now cover Medicaid, uh, Medicaid patients. So our KP Quest patients, we've developed a workflow um, and huge so that these patients, um, it's affordable for them. And then as I alluded to, it's just one of our challenges is really timing of referrals. And we're, we just need to probably do a little bit more education with our providers to get referrals earlier rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. You, you guys have just really done a tremendous job at Kaiser. Um, I do wanna point out under the law that you can mail the, the prescriptions um, throughout the state, but not every healthcare system allows that for different reasons. And we are gonna have Jake Blechta, our ph pharmacist talk shortly um, about pharmacy. In fact, he messaged us and let us know that now there is a patient on Molokai who just last week he filled a prescription for. So that's another um, neighbor island patient who's been able to get through the process. Um, Michelle, do you want to um, highlight any of the information from HPH? Um, this is quick. You guys can read the, the numbers, but basically like Dr. Miller said, for us, we had six patients who had passed away before their second oral request. And then total um, uh, 14 patients in um, both years, uh, year to day completed the, uh, took their the medical aid and dying, dying prescription. We did have a Maui patient for which uh, Jake did uh, immediately, 24 hours got it chipped over because the patient was waiting for his cocktail. Um, next slide. Uh, just quickly, um, our transition from 2019 to 2020, um, obviously every, we all had, all the organizations had to have their policy approved and that was done in 2018, ready, ready to start in January. Education, of course, uh, we did have our challenges. We had zero <laughs> to start with. So really doing a lot of education with, with both attending and consulting physician uh, participating. We did have one, our one of our first patients in Kauai she didn't have anybody there. So it, it, our Wahoo physician actually had to fly to Hawaii to, to get help that patient. And, um, and after we came back, we said to leadership, you know what, we have a neutral stance about it, but we have to get a little bit more engaged in neutrality because it's not just about being neutral. We have to help support our patients. And then, so we brought that case to leadership so that they can hear the story and the challenges we had to go through. And they were very supportive. I wanna thank Dr. Miller for presenting to our oncologists. That really helped. So it's nice today. We have a nice bunch of on on oncologists willing to support each other. Uh, we do incorporate, like you, I mentioned with Judy's story, palliative care consult is so very important. Um, having that big broad picture, the outreach to the others. And um, it's a constant to, up to date, you know, build, rebuild, what works, what doesn't work. And um, within our system, we're able to have like an intranet, we have medical aid a dying, um, we have the EMR support and the, they're able to get all the, the drugs and Epic and the smart phrases, et cetera, and Epic very quickly. Next slide. 2020, um, I'm, I'm so thankful for the physicians that are willing to participate, both for attending and the consulting. Um, and if they're not, they're like kind of hesitant, 
um, they know that they, people reach out to me it's like, Michelle, can you go and give them education? I'm, I, I've done that. And people who, and physicians who are kind of sitting on the fence, I, I do a one-on-one -on -one discussion with them, not only with them, but their staff as well, because maybe they're, then they're like, okay, I'll be the consultant, but not attending this time, but maybe in the future. So I offer, I'll always offer my services to, uh, to our physicians and not only to our physicians, but the in independent physicians as well, working with our patients. Um, I, I can't thank the team enough. It's an orchestra, Dr. Manai says, it's an orchestra. The social workers, the navigators, me helping behind the scenes, the doctors, palliative care, pharmacy, hospice, it's, it's the, the chaplains, the debt doulas. It's a, it's a, a teamwork. And um, uh, last, uh, most recently, we did have a dedicated presentation on um, the updated DDMA versus DDMP2 by um, Dr. Parrott from Washington. Um, and that was really helpful for our providers because it just gives them a more, more comfort, comfort in, in, in which medication and all the red flags and what if the patient can swallow. So that was really helpful. And then as Laura says, oh my gosh, telehealth has been wonderful. So not our Kauai patients can do telehealth with our Wahoo patients as well as our Maui patients and the telephone encounters. Thank you. Thank you, oh, Michelle. I, I just want to say you've done a tremendous job. Hawaii Pacific Health really has. It's a teamwork. I just wanted to share, this is something I have on the internet. And some of our doctors are like, well, Michelle, I, I don't know which step we are in, but also the same with our navigators and social workers. So one of my coworkers built this for me and it's a workflow. And all they have to do is press in the box and tell them what they have to do, what forms they have to fill out. And Laura's thankful that I do this because she gets to those forms within 30, you know, less than 30 days. I'm, I'm texting, I'm emailing them. It's like, did you complete that form? So everything is there, accessible, easy to follow. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think I know we now we have like nine minutes left and we do want to get to your questions. So I, I believe this is also from part one, Dr. Goodyear. Um, is there anything you wanted to highlight on this slide about the mental health evaluations? Um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I've, I've had 42 referrals as the slide indicates. Uh, 39 of those have been capable. Only two were not capable and one passed away prior to evaluation. So I, th I think that does raise the question of whether mental health evaluations are really needed for every patient. Um, they're not required on the mainland and um, it's something perhaps we can look at in the future. Thank you. All right, next slide. Oh. As, as far as transitions go, uh, the, the big change, as we've talked about, has been the change to telehealth. Um, other than that, uh, not too much has changed for me. I think I've fine-tuned my the format for my evaluations a little bit, but uh, basically uh, the same as they were last year. Thank you, Dr. Goodyear. All righty, next, um, very quickly, a poll question. Medical aid and dying prescriptions, can you launch the poll, please? Um, are given to the patient after the requirements of the Our Care, Our Choice Act have been completed, true or false? So the prescriptions are given to the patient after the requirements have been completed, true or false? All righty, let's go ahead and um, show the results. Alrighty, the majority of you said tr true, although as we'll go to the next slide, we shall see. It's actually false. So as I mentioned before, medical aid and dying prescriptions are mailed, faxed, e-delivered or hand delivered to the compounding pharmacy. The prescription may not be phoned in. Um, and if you have trouble finding a pharmacy, you can always call us and we can let you know uh, which pharmacies will fill medical aid and dying prescriptions. Next slide. Um, now we're going to, I think uh, we'll go very quickly through this one, Dr. Grube, if you want to talk about the pharmacist involvement. Yes, and I, and I think we should have Jake talk about this because uh, yeah. Jake has a lot more familiarity with this. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jake. Well, um, okay, so um, pharmacist involvement, you know, I basically, 
uh, talk to the doctors and then they try to let me know ahead of time if a prescription is going to be coming in for a patient so I can get it ready and make sure we have everything needed. And then once the prescription comes in, we can start contacting the patient and arrange for pickup or we can mail also um, just to get everything to be done as efficiently as possible. Um, so communication with the prescriber is very important and it helps a lot. Um, all the prescribers we've dealt with so far are very good at that and they've been helping you know, make things easy for us as on the pharmacy side. So basically we just compound the prescription. We'll answer any questions that the family and patient may have. Usually they've been educated fairly well by the prescribers and they don't have many questions. Um, um, and then the prescriber basically does most of the other work. You know, they, they, they submit all the forms and everything. We basically just, you know, dispense the medication and answer questions for the patient. Um, next slide. So I think this may have been covered before. Um, the timeline for the, for the DMA, um, there's two antiemetic medications for nausea that they take at the start of the procedure. Um, they don't want to know um, dairy products, no heavy laxatives or food for four to six hours beforehand. They can take their usual medications. Um, then they start take, and by taking the two antiemetics. 30 minutes after that, they take the digoxin. They, they'll get a bottle with a small amount of digoxin in it. There's instructions for them, but they mix it with liquid and they ingest that. And then 30 minutes after that, so one hour after the antiemetics, they'll take the rest of the powders, which all come in a, a four ounce glass vial that they'll mix and consume. Um, there is an option to have them do it, to have them do the antiemetics first, and then 45 minutes to an hour later, ingest all of the powders together. Um, and lots of prescribers are doing that now. And all they have to do is just indicate what they want us to do as far as mixing it, because then we'll dispense all of the powders in one bottle instead of two separate bottles one with digoxin and one with other three medications. Thanks, okay. Jake. We're going to skip the yeah. red flags because this was in part okay. one and those are really important. So if you missed part one, please do watch that. Okay. All right, go so ahead. these are the numbers. Um, these are numbers that we've done last year in 2019 and this year. And you can see this year we've already, you know, passed last year. We did 31 prescriptions total in 2019 and we're at 41 now here at this pharmacy. Um, and I know there's others being done at Kaiser and maybe some other pharmacies. And you can see um, at the end of last year in 2019, we started doing more DDMAs. The nine of those came at the end of the year. Before that, it was all DDMP2s. And in 2020, it switched. So now we're doing much more DDMAs. Um, I think pretty much exclusively DDMA now with prescribers outside of Kaiser. Um, and majority of the patients are, that are on Oahu, they are picking up from us. We can mail to them. Um, the Outer Island patients get it via USPS. And since there's kind of some delays recently, we've been doing it FedEx and it just requires a signature by the patient. Thank you, Jake. And I just want to remind welcome. everyone too that if the patient can't swallow the medication, um, if they have a feeding tube or an anal catheter, it is still possible for the patient to qualify as long as they can push the plunger themselves, they still meet the requirements of the law. So this is an option for, um, for certain ALS patients. Uh, and now we're going to talk to doc Dr. Sharfin about her experiences. Thank you. So I was actually asked to share some of my positive experiences and my not so positive experiences. So I love the team-based approach. And I have to tell you, I get really jealous when I listen to Dr. Miller talk. You know, I hear Kaiser stories. I hear Hawaii Pacific. Um, it's different in the community. And um, I'm a community-based doctor. And so Having a team is so extremely important, but it's not organized the same way. So I want to thank Jake as well, because he's been a huge part of my team. Um, I also want to thank uh, our hospices on our island, especially North Hawaii Hospice and Kona Hospice. They're a part of the team. When this first started, all hospices here were completely hands off. And I've seen that transition. Hilo still is not on board, but I'm hopeful that will change as well. So when you've got a little team together, it really makes the process very easy. I've got a mental health provider now that I can totally count on. And those cases happen. Uh, the two of them this year were easy peasy, really and truly. The two I really wanna focus on are um, not, they weren't so easy and uh, for different reasons. So the first one I wanna tell you about was, I'm gonna call him the captain and I got involved in his care. He was a 
metastatic prostate cancer patient. He was involved in a system that did not have policies or procedures in place, even though the law had been in place. And so when he approached his oncologist, who was absolutely in favor of his choice and wanted to help him, his oncologist was told he, he wasn't allowed to. Um, the staff were told they could not be involved. Actually, that wasn't true, but that misinformation cost him time. And this man did not have a lot of time. So by the time he found me and I took his first oral request, just looking at the patient and reading through his chart, I really didn't know if he was gonna make it through the whole process. I also realized very quickly that his, this choice was extremely important to him at the end of his life, his autonomy. So going through this process and finding someone was just, um, it meant the world to him. By the time I did his second request, oh, the one thing he did say to me that I thought was, was precious after the first one, he said, so what you're telling me is all I have to do is stay alive and stay sane. And I said, yeah, basically. And so by the time his second request came around, we were like, yay, you made it, you made it. Um, and he was so grateful. And, uh, but you know, there's still a little bit of a waiting period before I can actually write the prescription. And the day I wrote his prescription was the day he fell hit his head and most likely bled into his brain and died at home. Um, to me, that was tragic. Uh, his wife told me later that his last words were, what is today and when do I get my medication? That could have all been avoided had that system already put something in place um, and allowed those other physicians to be there. The good news about this case is one, he was fully supported by hospice. Um, so he did, um, I don't believe he experienced uh, too much pain. Uh, the other is this system changed because of the captain. They have a good policy in place. They allow their physicians, it's clearly stated. So his life did have meaning and I don't think other people in that area will have to go through what this patient went through. That's why the legislation is so important and that's why education and good policies prior are so very important. Um, the other patient I want to talk to you about, he is, uh, I'm going to call him my problem child because I have spent more time trying to get this man care than I have for any patient I've ever um, taken care of in 20 years. Um, his case is called Dr. Benadryl. And uh, this took um, on the Hilo side of the island. And I got a call from Sam because I don't, I don't see patients in Hilo usually. And when I get a call from Sam, I know something's up. And she's like, Dr. Sharpen, can you please be involved in this case? This gentleman has gone through everything. He's done his first oral request. He's waited 20 days. He's got his consultant, uh, both consultants. And when he went back to see his doctor, his doctor said, oh, sorry, I don't do that. And I suggest you either go home and die naturally or you drink a bottle of Benadryl. I wanted to believe that wasn't true, but he, he had a witness to that. And that to me was just devastating to hear that a, another physician would say such a thing to a patient at the end of their life. Um, and that just started the whole ball. Uh, when I got involved and in really looking at what he had done, yes, he had had all of this, the consulting providers. None of them had filled out any forms. None of them knew the process. Um, so I had to go back and keep knocking basically on their virtual door to say, hey, can I help you with this? Luckily, both providers, once they realized what they needed to do, they, they did it with no problem. They were really grateful um, to be shown the way. They just didn't know the way. So that again goes to how important it is for education. Um, the last piece of this puzzle was hospice because now he's in um, an area that doesn't support medical aid and dying, but they still support people at the end of their life. So I'm always encouraging people, please, please get into hospice. Um, I've never had a patient before this one that did it. And he was very reluctant because he'd already had um, a poor experience. Took me about a month to convince him to go for it. Um, I got an end of life doula uh, on his case too, which helped him as well. And unfortunately he again had a very bad experience and, and came off. And so, with this case, I felt very frustrated because here I am trying to, trying to, to navigate support in the community um, and it's not been that easy. But the positive flip to that is he now has two end of life doulas. His pain management doctor has come back on board. Um, my concern was when he did die, what was that gonna look like for his 13 year old daughter and his caregiver with the police coming in? So we've talked to the police and we have now a nice uh, supportive way that he will be able to die. And I get to meet him next Saturday, um, which is really exciting for me because I haven't been able to, to physically see him. So it is possible 
um, to create a very beautiful team, even on a rural island. Um, it is difficult and sometimes you feel alone, but it also just shows us how important it is to educate ourselves and support the patient in whatever their choices are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scharf, and what incredible moving stories. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we're a little over time and we, we don't have many questions. So I'm gonna answer them quickly. Although I do wanna point out one more thing that Dr. Sharfin didn't mention and that it can be really difficult for patients to pay for medical aid and dying. And there is a federal funding restriction on Medicare, which we talked about in part one. Um, and so both Medicare and VA benefits can't cover the cost of the visits and well, at least not the cost of the medication. Um, thankfully, as it was stated, the state Medicaid quest, MedQuest can cover it, but it can be very difficult and costly for patients. And there really isn't another option for some patients to be able to pay for having this option. And so that's something we're trying to figure out, but um, right now it can be very challenging for patients um, to be able to afford this option. So um, can you go to the next slide, Christina? Um, in the next slide. Sorry, we're like, we've been trying to edit these as we go the next slide, just the last one. Very quickly, I wanna say, talk about our resources and I know we're over time and I'll, I'm gonna answer the questions there. Um, I, I do wanna say, if you have a story, if any of your patients feel compelled to share their stories or if any of you feel compelled to share your stories, uh, we have a full-time employee at Compassion and Choices and all they do is help to share stories. And if nobody wants to share their stories, we're, you know, we completely are respectful of that. But some people find um, comfort in being able to share their stories and advocate so that others don't have to go through the difficulty of getting through the process like they did. So if anybody's interested in that, let us know. We have a wealth of information. Um, and I'm going to look at the questions quickly now, but we do have a doc to doc consultation line. It's confidential, free. You can talk to a doctor who's worked with a patient um, prescribing medical aid and dying if you need help or mentorship. Uh, part one of the series was recorded. We will send the link to both this webinar and the part one webinar um, in our follow-up email after this presentation. It probably won't be until tomorrow or the day after because it takes time to upload. Um, feel free to share those out with your colleagues if they're interested in this. Um, I know it's a lot to consume, but it's, it's so important for patients at the end of life to know, you know, to be able to access the full range of end of life options. We're going to try our best to make sure we can have closed captioning because we want to make sure that everyone is able to access this information. Um, the, uh, somebody asked about life insurance. So because the death certificate states the underlying illness, it does not affect life insurance at all. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about having this law is that it makes it really explicit that none of those things can, can be touched because the patient is dying from their terminal illness. Uh, they're just, medical aid and dying gives them a little bit of control over something they don't have control over. Uh, and yes, again, Quest does, MedQuest covers the cost of medication. And the last question I can't answer, I'm gonna have, this is for Laura. So I am gonna ask Laura quickly, how certain are you that the waivers and exceptions made during COVID um, will be eliminated? What evidence is there? And I'm not sure the answer to that. And I'd love to hear from Laura. I would say the jury is still out on that. Um, you know, they're, they're still talking about it. it. It's a bit of a battle. It comes down to costs, I think, in, in my opinion. Um, and so the, the waivers, like I mentioned, HIPAA, um, credentialing waivers, those things make sense you, because the providers need to be licensed in Hawaii. Um, and, and the other one is phone, telephone um, access. We do recognize that there are certain vulnerable populations that just don't have broadband. They don't have internet. They don't have enough um, data uh, in their cell phone plans. So um, I think that's to be continued, that conversation with um, MedQuest and uh, DHS. So I I'm not... I would say I'm fairly certain that those things that I mentioned will likely discontinue, but the discussions are still ongoing. Thank you, Laura. Thank so, you so much. Oh, go ahead, so, Dr. Miller. Just let me comment on that because I work with um, our national, or ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, who are uh, very involved with uh, CMS and trying to ensure as many of the, the looser policies that have been developed for the COVID uh, pandemic um, are, are gonna be continued. 
I can I I I speculate that I think the the issue about origins and rural uh, uh, space, I think those are going to go away. Um, so that doesn't matter where you are, uh, the, the physician will have the ability to do telehealth for sure. Not sure about telephone, but for sure telehealth, um, regardless of locations. And um, the reimbursement, at least what we are looking at right now, reimbursement for telehealth will be the same as face-to-face. -face. Tele, uh, telephonic communications uh, will probably not be reimbursed at the same rate. But it's a, like, uh, uh, like Laura said, it's a, it's a work in progress. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um... Thank you everyone for presenting today and um, bearing with us. I know we've gone about 10 minutes over. Uh, we will be sending you an email. We, we've, I, we've, I've sent the certificates for part one to everybody who joined that. So if you didn't get a certificate, let us know. You should have received it. It might've gone to your spam folder. Um, and we will be sending out all this information. If you had a question you weren't able to ask, feel free to reach out to us anytime. This is, this is what we do at Compassion and Choices. So we're happy to help in any way we can. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much to all the presenters. And um, I hope that this webinar was helpful. Take care, everybody, and have a good day. Aloha. Aloha.